So I have to start with an uh, apology because I only learned yesterday that I have to speak in English. So speaking in English is not a problem that late, but the problem is that I could not prepare all the slides in English. So what I did for today is choosing all the English slides I had and replacing them, <laughs> replacing them in the German presentation and in some of the German slides there's just some, let's say, English headlines. So if you understand German, there is much more information on the slides which you can read, but I try to give an explanation in English. Okay, so um, as Martina said, I'm the head of the Chair of Sustainable Urbanism and I want to talk with you about mismatches mismatches which somehow are obstacles in the transformation towards a more sustainable region and I have to say that we're talking about let's say sustainable urban redevelopment of, uh, of peri-urban regions and not uh, and we're not talking about the transformation of landscape too much. Um, mismatches um, actually is in the moment a really hot topic in uh, urban transformation research. Why? Because um, we know that a lot of architects are today working really in the countryside. We learned about the concept of ruralism, etc., etc., where architects come with a, let's say, an urban view and propose projects in the countryside, which very often are super successful. But the problem is that we cannot scale up these projects because they always require a very specific setup to be successful. We learned from Paul before that certain setups are more, let's say, um, uh, productive and others are not. And this is what we, we as architects are experiencing all the time. So my main research question at the chair in the moment is, do we have to relearn about what we already knew about the, uh, uh, the relation between the countryside and the city? So is it maybe wrong? what we have as a base for planning. And I want to talk about several things. The first one is, do we really understand what happens in migration processes between the city and the landscape? You might know from the papers that while the, um, the uh, crisis of housing in the cities is growing faster and faster, a lot of people say, hey, just shift the people to the countryside because there's a lot of space. And I think this is a very, very wrong assumption. The second thing is, what's about our understanding of urban spaces or more central spaces and peripheral spaces? Are, in a modern understanding of organizing your daily life, a peripheral space really a peripheral space? What are the images of the countryside and of the, of the city? When you ask the people, hey, how does the country look like, the rural look like, they come up with these kind of images, but actually it's looking like this. And this is also a very, very big challenge when you talk about transformation processes, because for that, economic mechanisms exist, while this is more a kind of a fairy tale, or this is just a narrative, which is deeply anchored in our cultural understanding of what the city and what the countryside is. Is our planning system, this is this famous drawing of Walter Christhaler on the, on the central place theory, is this actually a feasible strategy for re-transforming or redeveloping the peripheral spaces? And, as I started, do we really know this space? This is a study on, um, on uh, the Daseinsvorsorge, this is a German word, the English word would be basic, uh, basic daily services, so it's about health services, it's about uh, food services, etc., etc. <coughs> it's ongoing in the moment, published only in about two months, so we, you will get a preview. And last, and this is, uh, let's say, the last point I want to make today, um, can we as planners, be it landscape architects and planners, architects, do we really deliver the right plans and concepts? Okay, so this was actually just the, the table of content and I'm starting by just telling you what, what I'm doing at my chair in, uh, and I'm mainly uh, working in teaching and research and we are always working in 
uh, experimental laboratories which we develop together with stakeholders in the countryside. Because, um, as Paul said before, you cannot just come up with concepts if you're sitting as a scientist in a dark box. But you really have to talk with the people on the spot. So whatever we are doing, be it in teaching or be it in research, we're working together with the stakeholders uh, at the spot. And since uh, my main uh, uh, engagement in teaching is in the faculties of civil engineering, and architecture. We're having these project studios where we go with the students to the spots and working with, a, let's say, known instruments, but also inventing new instruments of talking with the people, like, for example, this uh, game which was developed for uh, a big transformation process west of Munich, where uh, the laymen, the people living there, really can puzzle, or puzzle <coughs> together um, a preferred situation and then getting all, let's say, the professional information <coughs> behind it. So if you puzzle it together, then you will find out, okay, what does this transformation process mean in time span, how long it takes, numbers, how many people will come, and risks. Um, <clears throat> from this information, then we're developing this kind of proposals. And this is students' work, very well done here in Wallersdorf. This is a small town in Lower Bavaria. Or in Trostberg, this is uh, also a small town in uh, Upper Bavaria. And what you're seeing here is that from spot to spot, we follow very, very different concepts. So I'm not teaching in the way that I'm saying there's a standard set of instruments. But for example, in Wallersdorf, we had to talk a lot about <coughs> new housing conditions and the quality of landscape, because this is something a lot of people do not know. The worst situation of the inner landscape is existing in smaller towns, not the bigger ones. The bigger ones typically have a very good um, network of parks, green um, boulevards, or something like that. And the villages are also OK, because they are very close to nature. But in smaller towns and mid-sized towns, you typically do not find qualitative outdoor space, which means that the people tend either to dwell in the middle of the city center, where you have a nice marketplace, or at the fringe of the landscape, and in between, there's just a rubbish situation, or an empty situation. Coming back to this later. Then we're also doing one-to-one uh, -one, um, studios, so we really build these things to demonstrate it, to really find out whether it's true, what we thought it would. Uh, like, for example, this uh, really strange uh, uh, wooden uh, pavilion, which is only one of several. Uh, which was built for creating an analog car sharing or mobility sharing system in the south of Bavaria, where we still have one of the last big existent holes in the, in the mobile phone uh, uh, network. So this is really ridiculous in Germany, but uh, there are still some parts of the country existing where you do not have access to mobile phone technology. Um, and then, um, one of the goals of these classes is also to ask new questions. Uh, in Tetau, in the north of Bavaria, we did a studio in a very, very heavily shrinking town, 30% loss of population, while the industry is growing like hell. This is a, a porcelain and glass industry, and they're doing very, very well. And you really question, <coughs> why are the people going there? Because we have this narrative in politics, just bring the work into the countryside, and then the people will follow. And we found out that there are just the wrong stock of buildings. The people don't want to have a single family home there. They want to be mobile. And you do not find a single rental apartment there. And this we found out by an experimental survey, Wohnstuschon oder Pennenstunov. You might know this line from the IKEA, um, from this IKEA advertisement. This is why we had to pay a fine. Uh, for that. <laughs> anyway, um, but do you live or do you still commute was really a provocation to the younger in the, in the area also to tell what they expect there. And we found out that these people, these young people finding good jobs there, they are living 70 kilometers away in Bamberg, commuting to this tiny little village there in Tetau because there is no space for them to live. But lots of empty houses. So, um, and, and this is, let's say, the, uh, the interface between research and teaching. And so over the years, we developed several questions like, for example, do we need new types of housing in the periphery? Uh, what is going on with the inner structure of the smaller towns, the so-called donut or double donut situation? What can we do if we go for more intercommunal um, alliances? Uh, what is the new mobility in, in, in countryside? And then the latest project, and I'm also ending with this project later, 
uh, in Switzerland, is there a possibility to activate the so-called housing mobility inside the communities with the goal to save a lot of space? Um, yes, and last we are doing some projects which are just, uh, let's say, compilations of different best practices, like for example this Baukultur Focus Land, which is a, a survey of the Alpine region and, and some, some other parts of Europe, like Luxembourg and Germany, where we found some very nice um, uh, examples, and uh, to, to explain what are actually the key ingredients if you want to follow a larger regional uh, building culture strategy. And my personal ambition is not to write reports only for the administration or the professionals, but to write a report for this guy here. He's part of the fire brigade of a, of, a, of a large industrial plant in Nuremberg, and we are always preparing our material in the way that these people can understand it. Because <coughs> if they don't understand it, they don't trust the information. Paul said that before. And if the people don't trust the under, uh, this information, you cannot, let's say, work with them on more, let's say, challenging questions, like, for example, projecting what's going on in the future. <coughs> Why did I show this building culture uh, thing as the, latest, uh, as the last image of, let's say, presenting what we're doing? Because my pre predecessor, Helmut Gebhardt, in the 1980s wrote a very nice book, which is called um, Vielfalt der Hauslandschaften und Monotonie der Neubruckbauten Haustypologien in Bayern. Besser bauen im Alltag. So better building in, let's say, your daily, uh, in the daily business. And he said what's going on in Bavaria is this, and we have to avoid this because we have such a rich building culture. And you understand that this view, in the 1980s, was very, very new. And it said, there is a tradition, please look at this, look at this, because behind this tradition, it's not only about form, it's about contextual conditions, it's about uh, economic mechanisms in the region, and we can learn so much, and it makes no sense to standardize everything. And 30 years later, one could say everybody understands that we have to work in this action. This is not new, even if in the fringes of our especially suburban uh, developments, we still find this kind of standardized uh, houses which have nothing to do with the building culture. However, I have a much larger understanding of what building culture is. Yes, we have to think about the products or the key features of the products, whether they look like this or like that, what is the material about, etc. But we also have to much more understand the context and the dependencies of several projects. Right? It's not, and especially in administration, it's not so, let's say, fashionable if you say, let's talk about the context, because that makes processes very specific in the regions and very challenging because you cannot just export something which you tested in the south of Bavaria to the north of Bavaria or to the Netherlands or Italy. You really have to think about the resources which we use for this kind of transformation process. But I'm not talking about materials only, but also knowledge. So what do, do we know? Because the result is very dependent of what we put in at the, at the beginning and what our abilities then are really to, to let's say, process this knowledge uh, which we invest there. We have to uh, think about the stakeholders and not only this, uh, let's say, very good architects on a mission to make the, uh, 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 the rural countryside better, but the everyday stakeholders, the one who just want to have a house and does not have so much a big understanding of what's going on in architectural planning uh, discussion or landscape or ecological discussion. Uh, and then, after doing this, maybe we have to think about, again, about the challenges that go and the success factors. Because it's not clear for everybody, we're not sharing a common view that, for example, we have to do certain things for being more sustainable. Sustainability is a very, very personal thing. You really have to explain to somebody, okay, what is your view of sustainability? And if I understand what you want, then we can work together to develop a better project. Okay, as I said, it's an individual thing, but there are some, let's say, very, very pertinent big concepts of, for example, the city and the countryside. And this comes from the, uh, from the Middle Ages, um, where there was, a, let's say, a kind of um, um, 
uh, territorial uh, organization given by law, given by societal things, which said there is a city, typically a walled city, and then there is a surrounding countryside with people producing uh, crops and then delivering it into the market of the city. This is uh, um, an understanding of city and landscape which is still there. But what is very important in this image is that a lot of people are not really thinking about these processes and questioning whether these processes are still existing. They reduce then this kind of territorial organization to key features, like for example, landscape is green. <coughs> and the city is something with a lot of buildings. Just have a look outside and you will see that there are lots of buildings. But a lot of people would say, yeah, but it's also green, so it's landscape. And so there is a kind of irritation uh, if you look at our today's landscapes, which then is not solved by really understanding the landscape, but really escaping into this kind of dream images, like here given uh, on this, uh, this lorry of the, of the company of Victorinox. They're doing this kind of Swiss pocket knives. Um, and they're selling this dream image because it somehow has to do with the image of Switzerland. It's, it's all positive blue skies, the nature in the back. Nature is not too close because nature is also a little bit dangerous, but then you have this kind of agricultural landscape, uh, vineyards, as you can see here, a castle and a tiny little village uh, embedded into the landscape. And the people are okay with this. And the next time I'm on a conference and talking with the layman in the countryside about, hey, what is your image of the countryside? They will say, it's like this. And then I say, no, unfortunately, it's like this. And if we're going on with this thinking that it's like this, then we cannot change this. It will never be like this. An even more tricky thing is that everybody has his own image, as I said before, of this city and countryside concept. And even if the metropolitan area is growing into the countryside, this strange thing that there are only, let's say, like a territorial organization where you only find two categories. So either the city or the countryside is also existing. I would say if you travel out of Munich to Freising and beyond, then I would say uh, with the motorway ring, maybe even with the middle ring road of Munich city, the, let's say, classical, typical city ends. So the limitations is here very much close into the city. But we are still, here in Freising, not in the countryside. So we have a large, vast area here, which is none of these two categories, but something in between, which is not understood. Third point. Um, very often these processes, like for example here, the process of migration, are very, very simplified um, uh, in, in public discussion. Um, and thus, uh, a lot of people do not understand what is really going on. They still think, People are going into the city, and fewer are going into the land. Um, and yes, we know uh, there was an era in the 1970s, 1980s, where suburbanization was much stronger than urbanization, and so the people moved into the countryside. Today, this portion of people which are going back into the countryside is shrinking. <coughs> And the city of Munich is not under such a pressure because there are more people going into the city, but because less people are going back into the countryside. And this you can see from the numbers, if you really look into the numbers, but if you're only looking at this kind of balance between in and out, and this is what typically happens, you do not understand that this process is very different to that process over there. The second thing is, that if you only talk about two categories, the large city and this tiny pastoral uh, um, landscape, you also do not understand that the migration of people is typically not happening from the village to the large metropolitan city, but the villages are typically going to small-sized cities in the countryside, and from there, they are moving into the city, the larger cities. So that means, there is obviously a much more complex process, which is actually that what you see, what you also saw in the, in the first image. So you see villages and small, very small scale cities, small scale cities, the larger cities, and you see these kind of balances of different migration processes. And here it's even more, let's say, um, separated uh, because in this green and red arrows, because green would mean I move from the land to the Stadt, 
because of the positive reason. I wanted to go there. And the red one means I, went, I moved from the countryside to the city because of the negative reasons. So I couldn't find a flat there, or I couldn't find work there. And you also have to understand that this is vital to understand whether you go because of a negative or a positive reason, because uh, you have to understand if you want to change these things. So what we have to change in the future is actually what is dashed in here. So we have to reduce the number of people which are leaving the countryside because of negative reasons. So give them work, good living conditions, infrastructure, etc., etc. And maybe we also should think about, let's say, rising the numbers of people going into the countryside, making a positive decision um, for settlement in these areas. But this you cannot do if the popular understanding is there are just a lot of people going because they want to go in the city. There's a fourth thing happened, which is also important, which is digitization of and individualization of society. In planning, we still have the idea, and Walter Christaller is, let's say, the godfather of all this kind of planning, that you can organize the world in a very strong hierarchical system. Which means, for example, you have these smaller towns here, and then you have a higher administrative level or mid-sized town like Freising, and then everything culminates in the state's capital, Munich. And you can export it to other countries, it works there too. Administration is pretty much organized like this. But if I, for example, would ask Stefan here, hey, what is your life about? He would say, whenever I have to make an important decision, I have to travel to Munich. And he's not doing this. He has his very own network. Uh, so from the individual viewpoint, you create your own networks, which have typically nothing in common with this kind of administrative top-down hierarchy. The problem with this is that, for example, if the state is making a decision to qualify the system, Maybe this is a misinvestment because the people have a compensation method which is not somehow monitored by the state uh, but which is in the end maybe more convenient and then you end up in a kind of clash between these two concepts. I will show you this a little later. So these models, be it the one of Walter Kristaller or the famous Tunen Rings which are, uh, is saying something about the, um, uh, uh, the, the logics of central markets they are still prevailing, but there is, this, uh, 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 um, let's say, an additional individualization going on which is overlaying all this system and which makes it questionable uh, whether we can just go on with our administrative procedures. And you can see it if you go, for example, to this parking lot in some suburban situation in Eggenfeld in the east of Bavaria, that these people, for example, they do not find um, this spot. Well. Everybody's saying, hey, if you want to talk to other people, then you go to the market square. No. They are somehow sitting in the cars, and obviously somebody built a very nice infrastructure for that, and so this they discuss here. This is actually, it's not, it's not fun what you're seeing on this image, yeah? Because this is also saying something about the reorganization of social processes. Like, for example, is this really a discussion, for example, maybe these two, two ladies are discussing about politics. Maybe not. But maybe they do. You don't want to have this discussion. You think it's worth, let's say, to expose yourself to the public and only then uh, maybe you also can balance out your own opinions. And this kind of privatization of certain processes is a problem for the society and for the coherence of society. I think we're experiencing it dramatically in Germany at the moment that we have having this more and more of these small scale systems which do not, um, let's say, balance out individual interests and, and common interests. Okay, but what is the problem with this kind of clash of the two systems? Is that A, we are doing our individual decisions which might not match with this, but the state has enough power, they can do whatever they want, so they will not, um, they will not disappear. But the problem is the other way around, in the end, we have a lot of peripheral regions which are lacking of infrastructure, functional infrastructure, because it's disappearing from the state. Because, for example, Stefan is not going to the next supermarket, but to the one in the next larger city, because they have 25 different sorts of strawberry marmalade. And he's not willing just to buy this one, he want to have this, have this choice, which has nothing to do with, with, uh, with planning, but with really, let's say, um, individual choice. 
And we're not thinking about these things. So what the state is actually trying is to stabilize these uh, rural regions by new instruments, by, for example, intake of rural development. <coughs> Um, and it's doing it very individually in these specific situations by, for example, participatory processes. I completely support it, but the problem is again that the state is, tr is trying to follow this kind of organizational scheme. Still. And this is a problem. Because um, that means that, let's say, the next generation of dysfunctional system is happening. I will just give you one example. Uh, in the moment in Bavaria, we have a lot of problems with bakeries. So the bakeries are disappearing. Because the state can control this, what you call food. Uh, uh, how, how do you translate that? In Zwittelhandwerk in English? It's kind of food craftsmanship, but don't think about the hipsters uh, with, with the beard, etc. But really think about <laughs> the people producing bread on a large scale. And the state actually can control these kind of businesses. But they cannot control, for example, that a filling station, a gas station next door is also selling the, the bread rolls. So, and maybe you can get everything at the filling station 24 hours because they are open 24 hours, but in the bakery shop only from 9 to 5. And then the baker is disappearing. So if they decide, for example, to establish this kind of bakery shop, it will fail very, very soon. And, uh, and so we really have to think whether we come up with totally different strategies. Okay, let me have a look to the, to the time. So, I'm coming from academia. And very often people say, well, what you're saying here is a completely academic problem. And uh, we know that we have these, uh, these challenges in the countryside, but we cannot solve it. And I want to show you just one example of how you can solve it, because the Swiss actually did. In 2005, they started a new um, process on reorganizing all the spatial administration. They said, A, we have to think about functional regions, and we have to accept that the functional regions are quite colorful. So it might be that in the canton of St. Gallen, in the east of Switzerland, there is not only one condition, and maybe it doesn't have to do with the question whether it's urban or more rural, but you have a lot of different, um, uh, different conditions and sometimes they are overlapping each other. And maybe they do not have to do with planning only, but you have to think about spatial development, environmental issues, agriculture and economics. And this is why we join forces and join the ministries. Just think about that. This is a dramatic revolution in administrative processes. And we're setting up a set of, let's say, common goals and common strategies we will follow in spatial development. What happened after 2005 is that the, space, uh, the Swiss gave themselves a completely new framework for national planning. They started to create a new knowledge about the space. They said all the knowledge we had before is nonsense because now we have different goals and different chances, so maybe we have to go back finding out what the microgranular uh, 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 knowledge is. They even started to think about um, different levels, for example, of infrastructure because it's more beneficial for several regions if you do it in a proper way. And they came up with completely new processes when it comes to regional redevelopment processes. And this is exactly what my goal is to establish these, uh, these kind of processes in Germany too. But we really have to work on the tools and we have to work on the spatial knowledge. Both is really not there. And I'm showing you some excerpts from these two um, research projects. The left one is about the integrated rural development. This is a, um, um, a voluntary informal tool uh, in Germany where smaller communities, typically villages and very small towns, can join forces and can come up with different projects like for example in administ joining force in administration, in infrastructural investment, in tourism, etc., etc. And this is a very strong framework in Bavaria, especially in the north, not in the rich south. Typically, all the communities which are rich are not part of these guys, these, these, um, these voluntary networks, because these voluntary networks, they, let's say, it's, it's like a kind of belt around it. So they join forces, and by joining forces, you also have to give guarantees to your neighbor that you're not just following your own business. There is a certain flexibility within this framework, but you have to deal with the interests of your neighbors. And the richer ones typically are not interested in doing this. And this is why you always have these uh, kind of uh, informal um, 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 conglomerates uh, uh, 
emerging when the economic situation is more uh, tough. However, I think this is one of the most clever tools because you really can set the fields in where you're working, where you want to work. And typically these, um, these ILEs start working in very, I, I would call them sunshine topics, like tourism. So you can uh, you, you start a new tourism concept, you could not do it yourself anyway, you have to do it in the region, and nobody is really heavily struck by the decisions you are doing there, and everything looks brighter and nicer in the end. But there are also some, let's say, tougher topics, like for example, what's about, for example, the daily infrastructure? And the strange thing is, and that you can see from this graph here, is that these tougher topics are very often not addressed in this in this informal um, planning processes. Why? Because the people know exactly that there is a loser and a winner in the game. And obviously they could not, let's say, find a way how to balance out interest there. So, and this is a critical thing. So they try actually, for example, to have the supermarket or the, or the baker shop or the filling station in their own community and not in the neighboring one. And so they're cannibalizing each other and in the end, Everybody is doing So it was a goal from the Ministry of um, Rural Development to find out whether we can do better and they gave a research um, uh, contract to us to think about the everyday infrastructure in Bavaria because they thought that this kind of planning framework we gave ourselves in Bavaria which is actually only making a distinction between the more more metropolitan areas and the rural areas and then in blue hatching here some areas which are let's say the poorer regions of Bavaria or the ones where you really have to deal with because infrastructurally there's something wrong. They said okay we cannot work with this. Can we have a very close view to Bavaria? And fortunately we had the chance to have very small scale data. So we're not breaking down all the data we have into community scale but to a 1 to 100 meter scale. So we know exactly where the, where the people are living in Bavaria, we know exactly where they are going to work, we know exactly where they go for, um, for, um, for getting their daily goods. And then if you, if you, let's say, break down the data to this scale, you find out that the tremendous number of residents of Bavaria has no direct access to daily infrastructure. While with, uh, with uh, kindergartens it's only 500,000 of a total population of almost 19 million. Um, it's, let's, I would say it's okay. With uh, basic uh, elementary schools it's 1.2 million, so we are already at 7%, which is okay too, because you have, a, a, let's say, mobility services for, for the pupils, but uh, there it is critical. With the uh, supermarkets or the little shops, it's also 1.3 million, and if you um, subtract all these kind of special initiatives like, for example, rural shops which are driven <coughs> by, let's say, non-economic interest, then that means that more than 10, up to 50% of the population do not have access to it. This is a shame, and if you're then looking, for example, to health service situation, it gets even worse. Um, okay, what did we discover? First, that obviously we do not find the big numbers of people there where we expected them, so we know that we have problems with the infrastructure here, remember the blue hatchings, but the biggest number of people which are, for example, not served by daily food services is the region between Augsburg and Munich. A very prosperous region, a very heavily growing situation, which is an indicator that obviously these problems do not come with shrinking, they come with growing, because we are not building the infrastructure which we actually need. So that means that we really have to check whether we are developing our country in the right way. Second thing, and there I'm in opposition to what Paul said before. If you look top down into the structure, you will find out that there are some regions which have problems. If you then ask in the regions do you have a problem or not, these two views, the top down and the bottom up, does not match at all. Why? Because, for example, in this region, in the, the so-called Rhön, in the north of Bavaria, we have a relatively good situation for, let's say, daily infrastructure. But the people asked there, they say it's horrible, because a lot of shops closed over the last years. They closed because they were extremely small. There were some very special structural situations along the former inner German border here. Um, 
And so the people have this feeling that there is a loss and that immediately means that you have a bad situation in the infrastructure. But the infrastructure is a pain. So if you ask the people, should we do something, should we invest states money here, then the people say yes, 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 but the state is saying no, we're not giving the money because we have much worse cases than people. So we cannot, we really have to combine this kind of top-down scientific view with, um, let's say, the more participatory processes there. Last point, and then I want to show you some projects. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really a little bit exceeding the time. Sorry for that. Um, we really have to look into the microgranular data. If we're just breaking, for example, the situation down to the level of communities and say, what community has an infrastructure and which one does not, then we get this kind of gray mask. And whatever is under the gray mask, you will not see. So the people living in these communities, not having access because the distance is too far to the next uh, infrastructural hub, are not seen by statistics, neither by the state statistics of Bavaria nor by the statistics of Eurostat. So um, uh, she's saying that I have one minute, but I can tell you I have three. Um, uh, uh, that means actually that we really have to come. We have to break this kind of limitations and come down to the um, to the small scale data. Okay, so uh, obviously I have too many slides and I will not go through it, but I want to give you some last, let's say, um, conclusions about what should we do then in planning. The first conclusion I will show you in the example of Wallersdorf is. A, we really have to look into these places because they work different and what is critical for the for the small scale cities is really its inner structure. And we're never looking at this. We're always fighting the single family house at the fringe and we're restoring the historic center, but the problem is actually the donut in between. <coughs> and we have to reactivate it and the plans actually have to first find out what the problem is and then really proposing something. And yes, we know. Maybe these spaces here are not interesting for a family looking for a house, but they are maybe interesting for the youngsters which are working in the companies and don't want to go to the next larger town because there is no space to live. Second, we really have to look in the demographic change and we should not only look the way that we're doing in Germany and Europe so that the society is getting older, but we have to look more in this way that there are generations with very, very different what they're expecting from space because only few groups of people actually are leaving the countryside. The very young and the young old. And the others actually are staying in the countryside. If we understand this, then we maybe should see whether this has something to do with preferences in life. And if you cannot answer questions like, for example, full access to digital solutions, then you never will attract the youngest. Why is this so important? Because <coughs> Demography also means that these generations are moving constantly upward. And so that means that we are not, let's say, solving the problem by just waiting, but the problem is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. My last point, and this is the project in Switzerland that uh, I showed to you, we really have to be more mobile in the future. The canton of Thurgau, they said, okay, make a project for the entire canton. We did together with the chair of the landscape architecture of my colleague Udo Weyerke, and the, the, let's say the core idea was to establish a process of inner housing migration in the small towns here in the city of Friedrichville, which says the people which are now living there in these old single family houses, they have special um, 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 requirements if they get older, so maybe for them it's more attractive to come up with new housing in the core, which loses functionality in the moment, and then these old houses can be used by the new dwellers coming to the area, expecting a single family house, and these houses in this process are also remodeled, refurbished in a more sustainable way. The problem is that today the people think that all the housing which you build in the city core has to be cheap. And this is not true. It has to be qualitatively very, very high. And then these people are coming down here. They're willing to do that and give up their own home. We did these kind of plans for the city of Wittwiele. Also showed them how the projects look like. But then, let's say the guidelines, how a city should act, look very different than the typical guidelines. So it has much more to do with, for example, the link of the city and the countryside the ensemble and its functionality, the strategies of how transformation works. 
And, and this is a challenging thing, and we're working on this in the moment, is we made a model for the city of Wheels playing through all these different options the city has to tackle that problem. And we found out that we end up in styrofoam blocks in different colors. And the different colors actually say that some of the projects, the white ones, can just go on in the building framework as we have it today. But the black ones, or the accrued ones here, they are more tricky. And there you have to come up with very new guidelines of how to build, who is organizing the process, what is the economic model behind it. And this is, let's say, today's work. I will not talk about that too much. Sorry for exceeding the time. Thank you for your attention. I hope that you could take something from this. Um, would you like maybe to still answer a couple of questions? Some clarifying questions. Sylvia uh, Winterwitz, City of Munich. Um, uh, one thing that uh, you mentioned the lack of infrastructure close to uh, or within agglomerations. Um, but isn't it very clear that the people are buying their things and using services in the big cities where they work? I mean, it, it's a problem for the people who are not working, <laughs> but I, I, I mean, that seems to me uh, to be the reason for this, uh, uh, yes. this uh, analysis or this yeah. result. Um, sorry to be that rude, but I would call this a Monaco-centric view of the world, because in, in Munich, actually, we very often think that it's like that. But if you look on distribution of workspaces in the area, you will find out that we have some very feral spots which have a very, very big concentration of workspaces. So the people are not all commuting into the cities, but there are lots of people, especially in producing industries, which are traveling outside, the commuting outside. And for example, one of the most problematic spots in this uh, uh, in our research, which we identified is the city of uh, Unterschleißheim, here halfway from Freising to, uh, to Munich, um, which is a very, very big working spot. But the city of uh, Unterschleißheim has, for example, the supermarket in this working area. So the people which are working in, in, uh, in Unterschleißheim are very well served, but they have nothing in the, in the city center with an, an, a number of inhabitants of 25,000 people. So economically, you cannot understand why you do not have a supermarket, but obviously, they followed a kind of planning strategy setting preference on the development of these workspaces and not so much looking what is going on in the inner structure of the, of the city. And if we go beyond from um, from Unterschleißheim um, to the next place, which is called Heimhausen, this is a small village, west of it, the situation gets even worse. So if you do not have a car, even if you have a very, very nice public transport system in the region, but this transport system is not bringing you to the supermarket, so you have to have a car. And if you do not have access to the cars, you are excluded from the use of these community infrastructures. So, yes, you're right, we're talking about, let's say, the situation of people are really traveling into the city. But this is not the standard situation in the very. This is a situation which only is valid in a very close belt around the very large cities of the very. And not for the rest. We have a question for Tweetback. Yep. Um, how to design public transport networks in non-hierarchical settlement patterns? Yeah, this is a tough question. And I'm not a transport guy. I cannot tell you. Um, and um, I'm, I'm also sharing the hope that new technology with autonomous, slow um, vehicles, which are just helping to serve to the mainland, could bring some ease. Uh, it uh, could bring some relief in the future, but I have to say that this is really a tricky, challenging situation. So, for example, in the in the region of Linda, we try to organize it with car sharing on the base of, let's say, coming up with a voucher system, giving individuals, let's say, the right to take passengers, and then they're getting some credits for it, and blah, blah, blah. But this only works on a very small scale way we can establish these trust systems. Set before. As soon as you enter not the village scale but the small town scale, so 3,000 inhabitants on, a certain anonymity, let's say, is uh, very um, uh, in, 
important to understand in, in your daily organization. So you do not know your neighbors or something like that. And then all these sharing systems does not work anymore. They only start working again then in the very large towns where typically the integration of people in a small scale city quarter is much higher than in smaller towns or in mid sized towns. But sorry, whoever had this question, I cannot tell because transport, transportation planning is really something very, very, uh, there's a lot of special knowledge on that and money I, I do not have this. Uh, there was a question for Stefan. Thank you very much for your very information-rich talk um, and providing this really this, this broad picture also about the situation in Bavaria. Um, and, and just to explain to the others also, um, uh, Mark Michaeli will not be present at the final discussion this afternoon, so that's also why we reserve a little bit more of time now for, for answering questions. Um, uh, I, um, uh, uh, you, you said also, it was also very good to, to mention, this is more common now, uh, that uh, these uh, migration patterns are much more complex than uh, what we may have in our minds usually. And just to add to that, uh, I remember from a very fine study of, uh, about the movement patterns in Copenhagen that also it's not about quantities but also about quality of, of who is moving out. Is it, is it young families that seek um, cheap space somewhere living outside? Is it old people that are for, pushed out because suddenly they have a drop in their income and so on? And, and they move to different places and so and in different uh, geographies uh, develop and that's also very interesting to understand I think and uh, also for landscape planning I, I imagine it's very important because uh, they may have different expectations and we know very little about that uh, there is no good uh, understanding of who is expecting what from the landscape uh, and how do they perceive the landscape and so on I would, pre I would just say so, so roughly uh, my question is um, uh, with this very interesting last slide about uh, how you imagine that within a, in a settlement um, one may um, create migration patterns that uh, uh, help to fulfill the different needs of, of different groups of the society. Um, if you look at instruments and mechanisms to make this happen, um, what can you say on that? Um, you, you, from the image one can see that you want to create different options, so to say. Does that regulate all? Or uh, I mean, we have ownership patterns uh, and then we have a market and so on. So how, what about that? Yeah, um, uh, that's a tough one because when you talk to the mayors, they typically say we know, all about, uh, we know about all these options, but we cannot act because we do not have access to the private property. That's true. Uh, and there is a reason why we did this study in Switzerland and not in Germany. And the reason is actually twofold. The first thing is in Switzerland there is a law which is saying the city, the settlement structure cannot be expanded. Which means that you have to organize your migration process inside the existing settlement situation. Which really changes the situation in the market dramatically. The second thing is, in Switzerland, they have these, especially in the smaller towns, they have a really big integration of, let's say, social processes. This is because they have a very different political system. So the, the people are talking a lot with each other. And what was in a very um, um, surprising for us in Bitwilen was that the, 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 the township government, so this is a town of 2,000 inhabitants, they said, well, they, the people do not trust each other, but they all trust the village administration. So maybe the village administration has a key role in the business model. And so what the village is actually doing with the model we prepared it for them uh, is now starting kind of playing games. What can we do? And are the people are willing? So and they're doing it with really singular owners. And this is why we also identified these 18 or 20 spots in the area. So they are, are pre-investing into this project and saying, and if you're willing to be part of it, then we will help you also with our subsidies for planning or uh, identifying your options, etc., helping you with the processes, etc. So actually the state or the, let's say the public sector is playing a key role there. Um, in this particular case they even set up their own housing development, um, it's not board, it's housing development union. So you can't also bring in individual capital and it's all under control of the, of the, of the city council. Um, so it works in smaller towns, and this is why I have to say that this is very, uh, uh, very, um, let's say, the, 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 the proposal is only elaborated for this scale, 
And it also works in the larger towns like Munich because there you have a range of different houses. So if I'm getting older, Munich is very uh, expensive anyway, um, then I move into a smaller flat. So there is already existing. But in the countryside, it's not because you typically have 90% single family houses and the rest is rental apartments on a very basic level. And these two, let's say, uh, um, these two elements in the market uh, cannot promote or propel or fuel this, this uh, relatively complex uh, process. Therefore, you need a much bigger range of different options. Like, for example, this house we qualified in Teta. We asked the people, hey, do you dwell or do you still commute? 14 parties said, I would love to live there, but I can't find a place. And then we made a housing union, 14 parties, and they redeveloped this old house there up in the north. And now in a community of 2,000 <coughs> 2, inhabitants, you have again 2,000 inhabitants, uh, accidentally, you have 14 rental apartments, very more than standard. Right? They never existed before. Which is sufficient. I do have to stop it now here. Thank you, Mark.